Do you ever feel like uh, it's Sunday and Monday and then Sunday again? That's that's the way I feel a lot of times. You know, it's a part of it. Like, what, how did Sunday get here so quick? Um, but it's also one of those things that uh, is a joy a part of it. And someone asked me, said, well, how do you do that every week and everything else you do? And I said, well, you know, you do things during the week so you can preach on Sunday if you love to preach. Um, but it's all, it's all a part of ministry. It's all a part of our lives. And when we think about those things, again, we're reminded of what Jesus said. Uh, there, we're called to be disciples. And there's a, there's a cost to being a disciple. Sometimes we don't uh, recognize that. And I might as well tell you, even though it's not there, I'll say it because I thought it again. This could be another one of those passages of things that Jesus said that we wish he hadn't. Does that cause you to think about scriptures a little bit differently? It has me in the last few weeks. Part of looking at, there's a, a, a multiple sermons in this one little part of Luke's gospel. So I'm only going to touch a part of it, which I think is central in those verses. What does it cost to be a disciple? Not too long ago, someone reported that there was a, a sign in a jewelry store. It said, crosses for sale, half off. Now that might not be too bad in a jewelry store, but it will not work in the life of the church and to be a follower of Christ. Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross, he didn't say pick up half a cross. He said, he didn't say pick up those things when you feel it's convenient for you to do it. He said, there is a cost to being a disciple. Remember Jesus' words, it says, If anyone wants to be a follower, they must deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. The cross many times has a strong relation to suffering and sacrifice. And guess what? We don't like that. We really don't. We talk about the love and the grace of God as a part of that. And, um, and we need that part, but there's another side to it in the midst of it. It's not half of the gospel, it's all of the gospel. In the midst of that, the cross reminds us that uh, with that, it's uh, undertaken. Jesus says, if you take up your cross, it's a voluntary act, and it's a love for Christ and a love and concern for other people. I just couldn't help trace, but thinking about your little uh, figures going in, all going in the right place. If you do one of the flood buckets and you see the list of things that are there, you say there's no way all of this stuff will go in. There's a way to put it in. It all will go in there. It's a part of our life. Sometimes we think, well, I don't know how I can fit in all these things that, that Jesus is asking me to do. Well, a part of it is you can't if we continue to follow our own agenda. Christ's agenda calls us to put first things first and the rest of it falls into place as a part of that. Sometimes uh, we need to be reminded that uh, carrying the cross will not earn us a ticket to heaven. The ticket to heaven is a free gift given when you and I acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and save our life. But Jesus was speaking again of total commitment. I watched... Uh, one team played football last night. The other one may have played well in the first half, but they didn't show up at all the second half. And a part of that is that sometimes when, as the announcer said, when you have young players, sophomore, freshmen and sophomores, a part of that, they don't understand that you can't give up because UK's defense spent a bigger part of the time on the field. And a part of it is to find out how strong you are and the stamina that you have when you get into those situations, and sometimes when you're young, you don't understand that. Young people today many times think as a part of, of doing that, and I, I usually find this out as I marry couples, young people today getting married want everything that their parents have, and the parents have worked 30 and 40 years to get it, but young people want it now. And it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> We think of those things. Jesus told us there was a price, a part of that. The disciples experienced that. I jotted down a couple of these because I didn't remember 
all of them, and I didn't give you all the disciples, but just let me give you a way. Do you know the way that some of the disciples of Jesus died? Listen, Andrew died on the cross, just like Jesus. Bartholomew was skinned alive. James was beheaded. Philip was hanged. The only one that survived death was John, and he was exiled to a small island. Others have similar stories as a part of that. Jesus' demands are quite high if we follow him, and sometimes they seem a little bit extreme. What do you mean to do this? It's a hunger after God that you and I are looking for. And I'll tell you what it does sometimes. Sometimes it will shatter our foundation. It will topple our priorities. It will put us at odds with family and friends. And at times, it will also make us strangers in the world that we live in. Have you experienced that? What does it cost to be a disciple? We find ourselves in the scriptures, a part of it, the beginning that we read was read in the period by Isabella, as a part of that is that there were large crowds following Jesus. Large crowds. When you get a large group of folks together, everybody may have a different motive. I hope your motive this morning was coming that uh, you're ready for the Lord to speak in some way and challenge you and encourage you to be a follower of Jesus Christ and for all of us so that we might follow him more closely. You think about that, there were some who were there because uh, they saw Jesus feeding the multitudes and they were there hoping that they would find food. There were some there because Jesus was healing people. There were some there hoping that they could get in close enough to have a conversation and they too would be healed. There were some there just for the sheer excitement of what was going on. Probably only a few of them, probably only a few, really understood why Jesus was here. Sounds like a former, the writings of a former police officer who said that many times they were called to, to work accidents and some of them were extremely severe. And he said after he looked uh, around for a while in his undertaking and retired from the police force, he, he recognized there were three groups of people that usually showed up at accidents. See if you can uh, understand this. There were those who were the bystanders and the onlookers, and uh, I just had to throw in the rubberneckers. Remember, sometimes an accident on the highway, somebody's turned around to look, and, and there's another accident as a part of it. They're not very involved as a part of that. They're just curious to see what's happened. Then there are police officers. They come, they assess the accident, they investigate uh, part of that and see who's at fault as a part of that. And sometimes then they hand out uh, some kind of punishment or penalties or fines for those who were in the wrong. He said the third group was the paramedics. Paramedics don't care whose fault it was. They're there to take care of those who are injured, to bandage a wound of God, to send them off so that they might get proper care because the value of their life is important. Sometimes maybe that's the way. Maybe there were those crowds. There were some that were there just as spectators and onlookers to see what was going on. There were some there who were trying to figure out. Remember we talked about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were there just to kind of assess the the damage had put blame on somebody and Jesus was causing a lot of trouble. And then, um, then there are those uh, who may understand what it means, as Jesus did, that we're there to help heal and work and meet the broken needs of the world. That's a part of being a disciple. Jesus, as he's doing that, and you need to understand a part of where he's coming from, Jesus was toward the end of his ministry. Even as we look at it now, they didn't know it then, but I think Jesus sensed it as a part of that. And he was looking and saying to them, and they were following, they were thinking that they were on their way to something else, but uh, Jesus was on his way to be executed on the cross. 
They like uh, also not only the other things a part of that, just what was going on, the, the healing and the food and, and part of that, but they also like to see Jesus when he spoke and he put the, the self-righteous lead, religious leaders of that time, uh, kind, of, kind of put them down because they weren't doing it the right way. They would think a coronation is coming. They're following a hero, but yet it's a crucifixion. And one is about to become the suffering servant for the world's sins. Your sin and my sin. Jesus then pulls them aside and says, everybody, these are my words, everybody sit down. We need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And then Jesus goes on to say, if anyone comes to me, does not hate father, mother, brother, sister, children, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Are we there? I'm sure there were some in the crowd saying at that point, well, what did he just say? What do you mean, hate mother and father and brother and sister is a part of that? I can't be his disciple, and even if I hate my own life, they may have said, that's not for me. But there's a cause to that. Jesus reminded him, and it might help you, it helped me a little bit to understand this. The Aramaic language that Jesus spoke is different from the word hate. It says, hate means to love a great deal less. It doesn't mean that we can't love our husband and wife, father and mother, brothers and sisters and friends. It just says we cannot love them more than we love Jesus. Jesus will not take less half a cross or half a disciple. There's room and enough love as part of that in our lives. And then he goes on to say as a part of that about the tower, it says, don't start something you can't finish. It talks about the army. It says, if you go out to battle, as he was using at that point, make sure there's strength enough to win. And then again says about following him, before you continue, before you continue following me, you better consider whether you will pay the price or not. If you stick with me, On September the 3rd, 2016, if you stick with Jesus, it will cost you. It costs a price to be a disciple. Now, some of you know I like to play golf, and I happened to, years ago, I remember at the, there was a, a senior tournament in Lexington, and some of the great players were there. These are old now. They're not playing anymore. Most of all are retired. Chichi Rodriguez, Gary Player, some of those there. I remember reading an article about Gary Player, and he said as he played golf, he said the crowds would gather along the side and kind of watch him, and every once in a while someone would say, you know, I wish I could play golf like you do. Gary would just kind of thank them and go on. And on one day, he was a little bit frustrated with his own golf game and wasn't playing too well, and yet someone said, you know, I wish I could play golf like you do. Gary Player turned and said, yes, you wish you could play golf like I do if it was easy. He said, let me tell you what it takes. If you're a golfer, we all want to play in, you know, pretty much in par golf. It ain't going to happen no more than we, we play. Gary Player said, if you want to play golf like I do, you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and you go to the golf course and you get a thousand golf balls. And then he said with your hands bleeding from holding the club and hitting that many golf balls, you go up to the clubhouse and you bandage your hands and then you go back and you hit another thousand golf balls. He said if you want to play golf like I do, you would want it to be easy, but it's not. And then he said, I hope you have a nice day and walked off. 
see if we thought it was easy. And sometimes that's what we think. You know, we get our names on the church roll, we're baptized, and then it's easy. No, it just begins to, to be a part of our lives at that point. And sometimes we forget that. I forget that. Maybe it would be good for us. Boy, you know, some of you will probably say, well, we wouldn't have anybody at all if we said that, preacher. Maybe we shouldn't talk about what we do in missions. Maybe we shouldn't talk about our Sunday school class. Maybe we shouldn't talk about our youth program. Maybe we shouldn't talk about the worship time as a part of that. Maybe what we would say is, if you want to come to my church and be a follower of Jesus Christ, it will cost you. It will cost you more than you imagined. Let me reverse some things, and here's what you might want to say to them. You will give far more money to causes for Christ than you can afford. You will carve out time in which to save, to serve people you don't even know, and you'll do it for no pay. You'll make other people's troubles your own. You will take an unpopular position on particular issues. You might lose some friends. And get this, you will follow a new lifestyle, not because you have to, but because you want to. And by the way, you'll have the time of your life. What would happen if we started saying, this is what happens if you come to Madisonville first. You give more to the causes of Christ than what you can afford. It costs to be a disciple. You'll spend time serving people that you don't know, and guess what? You won't get paid for it, not in this life anyway. To take a stand. Instead of allowing everything to happen to take a stand and stand for something because we are followers of Jesus Christ, to right wrongs and injustices and, and reach out to those people, again, as we said last week, to invite folks to dinner that can't pay you back. Jesus goes on to say, again, in verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Crosses often involve, again, suffering and sacrifice. And again, nobody likes that. I shared with Keith yesterday you know, an article, and he knew the bigger part of it, and there was one little bit of it. I said, do you know what the worst defeat of a, of a football, in a football game since football started, what the worst defeat of all time has been in history? Georgia Tech played Cumberland University School of Law. The final score was 222 to nothing. Cumberland was just battered and beaten. The story is told that the quarterback near the end of the game for Cumberland um, fumbled the snap from center and the ball was running around and he's been knocked to the side and he keeps hollering back at the, his his teammates, he said, pick up the ball, pick up the ball. Says the fullback stated to him, says, you drop the ball, you pick it up. <laughs> what I'm going to ask you this morning is, are you willing to pick up your cross? Don't blame somebody else for what's wrong in the world. Don't blame anybody else for what's wrong in the life of the church and the things that we're not doing. If you're not picking up your cross, if I'm not picking up my cross to be a follower of Christ, it costs. It's more, again, than love and grace. It's more than just a Sunday morning religion. It's a part of recognizing that on this table in a few moments, we'll share the sacrament of Holy Communion, representing the body and blood of Christ. Jesus picked up his cross and he fell under the weight of the cross, and someone else picked the cross up so that he could be crucified on. Our life is lived out of gratitude of what Christ has done in our life. The story is told of Pastor Harford Luca had two granddaughters, and uh, he asked them one year what they wanted for Christmas. Now, Christmas is closer than you think, folks. It's right after Labor Day, not too far. You realize that. 
And what the two granddaughters said is, Grandpa, we want you to give us a world. He was a little bit surprised with that, what they meant, and Mom uh, translated. What they want is a, a globe that's lit, that has a light in it so you can see the world. Well, take that, that one globe. That's what it was. I messed up on a lot. It's early in the morning. I had this a cup of coffee. But they, he just got a regular globe and gave it to them, and they, they were disappointed. And they said they wanted one that was lit. And his grandpas would say, what did grandpa say? I can fix that. And so he went and he found uh, two globes and they were lit. He gave it back to the grandchildren. And he said, it was a few days after that. And he said, I'm talking to a friend. And he said, this is what happened at Christmas. And he said, I learned a valuable lesson. To light a world costs more. If you and I are called to be a light to the world, it will cost us more. It will cost us more to be the kind of people that God's calling us to be. I don't know what that may mean for you. I'm trying to sort it out for me. But I know that sometimes it's not just a half off. We get a good deal in a jewelry store on the cross. If you wear a cross, let it be a reminder that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you see someone else wearing a cross in the coming days, ask them or just say, no, I know that you have a cross. I'm a Christian. And I grant you that some of them are wearing it more to be a fashion statement than they are to be a follower of Christ who died for them. I shared with them very on Monday night at the Ad Council meeting as a part of my devotion from Seabed for Monday, and I'm going to leave this with you as we move into communion. Part of the scripture says at that point, it uh, starts out, who is the greatest in the kingdom? It comes from Matthew. It ties in this part in Matthew 18 that says, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him, stood among them, and he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Six words. Six words is a part of that that stand out. That in couplets of three, or there's two couplets, the part of that, three words a piece. Unless you change, you shall never. Unless we continue to change to become more and more like Christ and walk more closely with the disciples, it's not halfway. It says we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And do you remember the words from the Transfiguration? Another couplet of just three words is a part of that. A couple is two, but it's a little triplet of three words. You remember what they are? Listen to him. Unless you change, unless I continue to change, I will never listen to him. It calls to be a disciple. I'll say again, that's one of those things I wish Jesus hadn't said. But I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did that because I know what he is. And I think what he wants from me and what he wants from all of us is more to pay the price. Not for our own benefit, but that the kingdom of God may come in our midst. And how that may happen, I don't know exactly. But I know that uh, maybe we all have some things that need a little bit of changing so that we can say, I am a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. There is a cost. There is a cost. It cost us everything. But what we get back in return, what we get back in return is far 
pray with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we bow in your presence now, we confess that we know this morning that we've probably all missed the mark of being all that you would have us to be. At times we've done that which is convenient. At times we've uh, done those things that are of our own will and desire. But this morning again, we have an opportunity to renew our commitment and make the decision that we will be true disciples. That we will love you more. Not love you less than we love family and friends and others. But in loving you, we know that you love those that we love. And so there is an abundance of love. We don't know but in part of what it really means to be disciples. It may cost us many times more than what we could ever think or imagine. But Lord, you've not left us. You are with us. So forgive us and cleanse us now as we prepare to receive this sacrament of Holy Communion. We pray that you would pour out, pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread that has come. And then pour out your Spirit on us. That as you have been a servant to us, we can be a servant for you and reach out to others. Not because we have to, but because we want to. Living a life of gratitude for the price that you paid on Calvary's cross. And to thank you that when we die to ourselves, we have the promise that we can live unto you and we can live eternally. Bless us in our time now through this sacrament. And again, may your Holy Spirit come in a special way in Christ's name.